Hi there, my name's James. I'm one of the pastors at Campbelltown Baps. Uh, we've been working through a series in Mark's Gospel, and today we come to the heart of Mark's Gospel, the turning point or the hinge where Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ and Jesus starts to teach what it means that he's the Christ. Uh, we've got Easter coming up, and so there'll be some uh, online material for Easter, a sermon for Good Friday and for Easter Sunday. And uh, I want to encourage you, if you're able, come along to our services due to the change in restrictions from uh, this Easter, 2021. Uh, our, our Campbelltown service on Sunday mornings, we're going to have one service at 9.30 on Good Friday and on Easter Sunday, as well as a 6 p.m. service. Anyway, I'm going to read Mark chapter 8, starting at verse 27, uh, up to 9.1. I'd love you to follow along with me. Let me read. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing the disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's, Will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in glory, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. All right, I'm going to pray and ask God to help us as we spend time in this incredible passage. Lord God, I ask that as we spend time in Mark's gospel, that we'll see clearly who Jesus is, that we'll understand what it means to follow him and that we'll follow him faithfully. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the early days of the internet, I remember, uh, this is so for me, late 90s, First time we got internet at our house, 99. I remember getting emails from people. And Christians would send these emails and they basically said, if you love Jesus, you'll forward this email to every contact in your email list. And they would often read, like 838, they would, they would often include this verse, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the son of man. So it was like this massive guilt trip to send this thoughtless and socially inappropriate email to loads of people who weren't Christians. I, I don't think I ever forwarded them, partly because I thought them manipulative and pointless, but also, if I'm honest, partly because the prospect made me fearful. But thinking about the end, thinking about what my life will add up to and what God will say about my life is actually really helpful. And this passage, what Jesus has to say in Mark's Gospel, really does force us to consider what our lives are really about and whether it's worth it. See, the truth is in my life I've, I've really cared about some dumb stuff. I've got angry and upset whilst watching grown men kick a ball around a field. When you think about it, it's, it's really dumb. I've got really fixated on certain toys that after a little while I just threw out. You think, why did I care so much about tomorrow's rubbish? I've argued with people I love over really, really dumb, petty things. And in that moment, I've cared about being right more than nearly anything else. And my guess is you have too. And my guess is if you're anything like me, you still find yourself caring about the wrong things. Most questions in life that people could ask us have very little impact. You know, do you want fries with that? I mean, if you say yes over and over again, that's going to have some impact. But 
it, it's not a big one. There are some questions that sh will have a big impact. Um, will you marry me? If you're the one asking, their response is going to have a big impact. If you're the one being asked, your response is going to have a big effect on your life. But in our passage today, Jesus asked his disciples the question. I'd argue perhaps the most important question you can answer. The most important question you can be asked in life, Jesus asked his disciples. Because how you answer not only shapes the way that you live your life, but also eternity. And that question that Jesus asked his disciples, but who do you say that I am? That is not only Jesus' question to his disciples, but Mark records it because it's Jesus' question to you, to us. The thing is, it's not a right or wrong kind of question. It's not a A or B or C or D multiple choice where you tick the right question and then you're good with God. You see, you can answer that question correctly, theologically. You can say that Jesus is the Christ and yet completely misunderstand what that means. We see in the gospel, so far in Mark's gospel, the demons are the ones who know who Jesus is and yet they're not saved. They're not the ones that are part of God's kingdom. It's one thing to answer correctly about who Jesus is. It's another thing to live life in the light of it. And so if you're watching today and you're checking out the Christian faith, you're investigating who Jesus is, I was so glad that you're watching. And Jesus is asking you to draw some conclusions about who he is, and he's putting forward in really blunt, honest terms what it means to be one of his people, one of his disciples. And I want to invite you to consider that question, who do you say I am, that Jesus asked today. And for those of you who are watching who are Christians, I think most of us can get the, the answer right. We can say Jesus is the Christ. We can say he's the Son of God. We can say lots of true things about him. But the challenging question for us today is, are we living our lives in light of it? Are we actually hearing what Jesus has to say about what it means to follow him? And I want to encourage you, in light of what Jesus says in the back end of this passage, Eternity is on the line. This really matters. And so here's the plan. We're going to briefly look at the context of this passage, and then we're going to try and answer two questions, real simple questions. One is, do you see Jesus clearly? And two, what does it mean to follow him? Now, as I said at the start, this is really um, at the heart of Mark's gospel. So far in Mark's gospel, Jesus is the, the rescuing king, the one who heals people, and he shows these signs of the kingdom. He's been moving in and out of Gentile territory and Jewish territory. But here, he starts to reveal the truth that he's not just the rescuing king, but he's the suffering king. And the disciples are confused. They don't see clearly. But from verse 27... When Jesus is in Caesarea Philippi, from there he's going to head directly to Jerusalem and head to his death. Now, if you've got a Bible in front of you, in chapter 8, verse 18, Jesus has a go at the disciples and he says that they can't see clearly. It has echoes of chapter 4, but he's having a go at them for not really understanding what he's talking about. He says, you, you guys, you still don't get who I am and you still don't get what I'm saying. And then in verse 22, we have this account right before Peter's confession of Jesus as the Christ. It's quite strange. Jesus heals a bloke in Jewish territory. He takes him by the hand out of the village and he spits uh, on the guy's eyes and lays his hands on him. He's blind and the man's sight is only partially restored. It's like, did Jesus not spit enough? Did he say the prayer wrong? Is he lacking power? And he asks the guy what he sees, and he says, I see people walking around like trees, which is a strange idea. And then Jesus puts his hands on him again, and his sight is restored. Jesus sends him home, says, don't go to the village, head home. Now, on the one hand, this passage points to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. The Old Testament has promises that when the, the one who will restore Israel's fortune comes, he'll heal the eyes of the blind, he'll open their eyes. But many commentators think that this is a picture of 
the disciples' sight of who Jesus is. He's just said, you guys don't see clearly. And then there's this partial healing and full sight given to a blind man. And then right after, Peter says, you're the Christ, and then tells the Christ that he's wrong, and Jesus calls him Satan. Now, this should make us pause because it means you can be really close to Jesus and still not understand who he is. You can be in close proximity and miss the point. Um, My grandfather became a Christian sometime in his 50s and 60s, sitting in a Bible study when he was already a warden in an Anglican church, like a deacon. He was a church leader and not a Christian. You can be close to the action and still miss the point. But let's turn to verse 27 and let's think through this question, do you see Jesus clearly? So they're in Caesarea Philippi, which is about 25 miles, 40 k's north of Bethsaida, where they were, north of the Sea of Galilee. This is a Gentile area. And Jesus asked the question, what do people say about me? And the, the response of the disciples is actually a little bit strange. John the Baptist, like John the Baptist reincarnated, maybe the idea that like after Elijah was taken up to heaven, Elisha had a double portion of Elijah's spirit and miraculous powers maybe the jews were thinking in those terms but that another answer is that he's elijah you know malachi 3 and 4 promises that elijah who didn't seem to die was taken directly to heaven will return to prepare god's people for the coming of god so maybe jesus is the fulfillment of that even though jesus says that john the baptist is the one who fulfilled that promise and then lastly one of the prophets maybe jesus is the prophet that Moses said would come, a prophet like him. Maybe he's a new Elijah or Elisha because of his miracles. And you kind of get the hunch that Jesus is starting by asking about others' opinions in order to zero in on what their opinion is. And so he nails them. He says, well, what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. Now, as a reader of the gospel, we know from the first verse, Mark wants us to see that Jesus is the Christ. And it's like, finally, someone other than a demon gets it. It's like the moment of applause. They got it right. The disciples are finally catching up. But before we keep going, we've got to make sense of this word Christ, because it's a word loaded with meaning. The Greek word Christ comes from the Hebrew word Messiah. We think Messiah just means saviour, and we get that really from Jesus is the saviour. But for a Jewish person, Messiah or Christ, it means anointed one, one set apart by God for a purpose, chosen by God. The priests, the high priest was anointed, chosen. The king was anointed and chosen. Some of the prophets too, but the Christ in Jewish thought really was the promised Davidic king. God said to King David, you will have a descendant on my throne forever. And the Jews were looking for a new David, a king who would rescue God's people, who would redeem them from Roman oppression, who would give them freedom and restore them to greatness, a king whose kingdom will last forever. Now, the reason why Jesus charges them to tell no one about him is because he recognizes that they don't get it. They're looking for a king who's going to fight a war. They're looking for a king who's going to throw out the Romans. And yet Jesus is a decidedly different kind of king. Now, this view really common in the first century. We know that other Jewish writers in the first century were looking forward to this kind of Messiah who's a revolutionary, a warrior, a general. And it's clear that the disciples have been drinking from the same fountain. And so Jesus now in verse 31 blows this idea up. Have a look with me. He began to teach them that the Son of Man, that's an allusion to Daniel 7, the Son of Man was a glorious figure, that the Son of Man must suffer many things. Must. He's the king who must suffer. He's going to suffer at the hands of the elders, chiefs, chief priests and scribes. That's the Sanhedrin. That's the leading authorities in Jerusalem and be killed, and after three days rise again. Look at verse 32. He said this plainly or boldly. That can mean he held nothing back. There's no parables. Jesus says, I'm the Messiah who's come to suffer. And no Jew had a suffering Messiah in their category of thinking. And so Peter won't have it. He rebukes Jesus, and then Jesus gets stuck into him. I mean, I've been called some bad names in my life, but imagine the Messiah calling you Satan. Get behind me, Satan. 
For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So I want you to consider for a second, do you see Jesus clearly? Mark wants us to make a judgment, a decision about who Jesus is. He wants us to make a confession like Peter that he is the Christ, but he doesn't want us to misunderstand what that means. See, Jesus is claiming to be that promised Messiah, the king who will rule forever, but the path to glory is suffering. The path to life is death. Now, C.S. Lewis said that if Christianity is to be true, well, he said Christianity must be either infinitely important or infinitely unimportant. If it's true, it's infinitely important. If Jesus really is the Son of God, the one who rose from the dead, then he matters more than anyone else in the world. And if he didn't, if he didn't rise from the dead, if he's not who he said he was, then Christianity is infinitely unimportant, not unimportant in terms of understanding human history, but unimportant in the sense that he's a liar and you shouldn't listen to him, trust him, or give him any airtime. And so not only is Jesus revealing who he is and calling us to make a judgment on that, he's also making a statement about us. He's saying that his coming, his life and death and resurrection is a rescue mission. He's saying that you and I, we need rescuing and that we can't save ourselves. That the way we get life is through his suffering, through his death, through his resurrection. Now, if you're watching this and you're not a Christian, I want to encourage you to consider Jesus' question, who do you say I am? To go back and read uh, the start of Mark's gospel and to carry on reading the rest of it and make make a call. Make a decision. Ask good questions. Think through the question, is he really who he says he is? Or is he a fraud? Come to him in your weakness because he comes as a rescuing king. He doesn't come to give us um, a whole bunch of rules and things to do in order that we might be saved, but rather he comes to save and redeem and rescue. But he does it not by killing Romans, but by being killed. He is the unique one in human history. And Romans 10 says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that is, he's the king, he's who he says he is, and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. Mark is inviting you to answer the question, who do you say Jesus is? Now, as I said at the start, the answer is not so much demonstrated by the words that you might say as a one-off, but by your life. You see, if you view Jesus wrongly, you'll view what it means to follow him wrongly. If you're not a Christian, Jesus is going to put before us in this next section what it means to follow him. And it's not the most compelling sales pitch that people would expect. Yet if you're a Christian, I want to encourage you to think the challenge here is simple. Are you following him like Jesus says you should? So we've considered who Jesus is. He's the Christ, the one who's come to suffer die and rise in order to rescue people. But now we need to consider the question, what does it mean to follow him? Have a look at verse 34. He's just rebuked Peter and now he calls the crowd to himself with his disciples and he says these really confronting words, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What a sales pitch. The life of following Jesus is one of self-denial and suffering. This idea of take up your cross, it's the idea of a crucified, a person who's being led out to be crucified, carrying the cross beam on their back. Probably carried out, probably completely naked, shamed, humiliated, to die a cruel and brutal death. So you ask the question, well, who would get excited about that? The first thing we need to consider is what he actually means. So here's the the first thing, I think. When Jesus says, let him deny himself, he means that to be one of his followers is to live a life of self-denial. It doesn't mean that you would do the opposite of any desire. I'm hungry, I therefore won't eat. I'm thirsty, I therefore won't drink. You know, it's not saying that. But rather he's saying that because he's the Christ, the King, the promised one, that to follow him means having Jesus rule over every 
area of your life, especially in those areas you want to hold on to. And I guess uh, here's a question that will help you think this through. What is the goal of your life? What are you hoping to do with it? What are you hoping to achieve? Is it a certain job or a certain level of financial freedom? Is it certain relationships? Is it health or comfort? And is the goal of your life about you? Where does Jesus' kingdom fit? Does it? See, Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you must submit to me as king. You must submit to me all of your wants, all of your ambitions, all of your dreams to him. He says his kingdom is the only one that matters and our kingdoms must die. It's just the idea that you don't fit Jesus into your life somewhere. Jesus becomes your life. He calls us to a life of sacrifice for the sake of his kingdom. It's a complete reorientation on what a person's life is about, where Jesus, the King, the Christ, the Promised One, rules over everything you have and everything you are. It's not, I'll make room for Jesus. I'll let him into some aspects of my life. And it's certainly not, I'll ask Jesus to serve my kingdom. You know, a good question to consider is, are you playing God in your life? Are you wanting Jesus to serve your own agenda? Jesus says to Peter and to us that that attitude is satanic, that that approach to Jesus where Jesus exists to serve your purposes is evil. It's setting our minds on the things of men rather than the things of God. And so following Jesus means my life is about him. I will deny myself in order to submit to his purpose and his rule. But it also means suffering. That that image, take up your cross, I mean, it's a picture of painful self-denial. And it's a real picture because Mark is writing to Christians in Rome, many of whom suffered under Roman oppression under Emperor Nero. Some of them were crucified. Mark is saying that these first century Christians embrace pain and humiliation for the sake of Jesus. And that is confronting. See, our culture, we love convenience and ease and comfort. We don't like to admit it, but we are often like Veruca Salt, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. You know, we want the world. We want the whole world. We want to, what is it, wrap it all up in my pocket. It's my my bar of chocolate. Give it to me now. We don't say it as bold-faced as that most of the time, but our hearts long for what we want. We want what we want. If you're watching this and you're a Christian, the question is, are you any different? Are we as Christians spending our days trying to gain the world? Do we do all we can to avoid pain? Are we happy to serve as long as it's convenient and doesn't cost anything? Are we happy for Jesus to give us good things, but we're actually holding on to our money and our time and our comfort with bare-knuckled stubbornness? See, Peter, his imaginations of Jesus' rule as Messiah, Peter wants worldly comfort and status and glory and power. He wants to rule beside Jesus. He is not interested in following a crucified king. And I think the truth is we often are very much like him. Our lives betray it. Sure, we do some good, but we often use that good we do to pat ourselves on the back and justify our hold on to everything else. If you're not a Christian, Jesus is not doing a bait and switch here. He's laying out very clearly what it means to be one of his people, what it means to be a Christian, to acknowledge him as the Christ, the King, and then to live out your life in submission to him as King no matter the cost. This image of the cross, it's not simply a metaphor, but for many Christians in the first century, a reality. Jesus calls you to come to him in in your weakness and offer him everything. And Christian friend, the, the question for you is, are you really a disciple? Is your life actually satanic? where Jesus exists in a nice little space that you seek to control and you want him to serve your agenda rather than you be a subject in his kingdom. 
And if you're confronted by that, I want to encourage you to repent. If you're convicted that your following of Jesus comes with a whole lot of special conditions, a bunch of asterisks and caveats, then admit it. Confess. The beauty is that this king is ready to forgive. And so Jesus is the Christ who calls his followers to come after him, to deny self and take up their cross. And so uh, that begs the question, why do it? Why would anyone be a Christian? Uh, I want to show you as we finish three reasons why this is the best news in the world. And here's the first one. Jesus does it first. Have a look. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And then Jesus denies himself, heads to Jerusalem, and he takes up his cross and he forfeits his life, his very soul, his very self to rescue you and I. He does it and he did it for you. He offers the most pure, the most deep and profound love that there is. He seeks our good despite his own rejection. He's totally selfless and totally vulnerable on the cross. He loses his life in order that we would gain it. You know, every other king in human history calls on his subjects to die for him, to save him. But Jesus is the king who dies for his subjects and saves them. And then he calls you to follow. He's not asking you to do anything he hasn't done first. And he doesn't ask you to do it as a means of earning his death. He goes in front and does it. So why why deny self and take up your cross? Well, because Jesus does it first in love for you. That's the first reason. Here's the second one. Following him in this way leads to life. There are some things in life that are counterintuitive. You do the opposite, that you think you should. Like in the movie Cars, Lightning McQueen needs to learn to turn right to turn left. I, you know, I don't really get about drifting in my car, but I'm, I'm just going to trust him that that's how it works. But look at verse 35. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. Jesus says, if you want to live, give up your life. It, it sounds completely, it is completely counterintuitive, but Jesus is saying when we as humans cling to worldly things over and over, we're actually clinging to death. When we try and save ourselves, rescue ourselves, we cling to death. But when we, we forfeit our life for Jesus' sake and for the sake of his gospel, that he's the king, that the kingdom of God is at hand, that he's come to rescue us, there's life. Life is found in that. I put it this way. Try and cling to your kingdom and your agenda. You'll lose everything. But if you give up everything, you get life. You know, in Australia, in the West in general, when you compare our lives now to all of human history, we're really richer than ever, healthier than ever, we live longer, we have greater luxuries, greater education, more leisure, more freedoms than nearly any other people in history. And yet culturally, we're more anxious and overwhelmed and unhappy than ever. Jesus is pointing out that if you try and live your life to gain the whole world, you will lose it. Live your life to gain status and you'll lose it. Live your life to gain money. You'll die and lose it. Live your life in order to be loved by everyone because of your beauty. You'll get ugly. But when you lose everything for his sake, you gain life. You know, maybe the reason, if you're, if you're a Christian watching this, maybe the reason why your faith so often doesn't satisfy your soul or give you joy or peace. It doesn't move you in any ways because you're actually trying to use Jesus to fulfill your worldly desires. Because you think that if Jesus would just give you that thing that you really want, then you'd be happy. And maybe God in his mercy is showing you the emptiness of that. See, Jesus says to have him and lose everything else in your life is to be better off 
than the person who doesn't have him and has the entire world. Resolve, if you're a Christian, to give it all up, to, to relinquish your control. It doesn't mean that you will sell everything that you have and go and live on the street, but it does mean that you submit to Jesus as king, that you, you seek to honour him in every area of your life, that you're ready to experience cost and loss for his sake, and that you'll count it joy and cling to him above all. So why deny self, take up your cross and follow the Christ? Because Jesus does it first, because it leads to life. And here's the last thing, the final reason to remember. Verse 38 is haunting. I, I started with this verse, you know, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man be also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Here's the truth. There are times in my life where I've been ashamed of Jesus. And so this verse can scare me. Uh, you know, like we feel like if we get it wrong that we're doomed. And I want to encourage you to remember some really foundational truths. We are saved by Jesus' self-denial and suffering. We never, ever earn grace. And in Mark's gospel, Peter will talk a really big game. He says, I'll never be ashamed of you. I'll never deny you. And then at Jesus' most desperate point of need, Peter denies even knowing Jesus. And yet, at the end of Mark's gospel, after the resurrection, the angel says to Mary, go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. We're going to talk more about this at Easter as we look at this passage in a little more depth. But what's amazing is that Jesus' heart towards Peter and towards us as we get it wrong is one of tender mercy and compassion. Jesus fails, sorry, Peter fails as abysmally as any disciple could, and yet Jesus shows him grace. And so if you've listened to this and, and felt really overwhelmed, you, you feel like a failure, you, you recognise that you so often use Jesus for your own agenda. You have your mind set on the things of man rather than the things of God. Don't imagine that Jesus' heart is hard towards you. His heart is one of tender mercy. The whole reason he came to rescue us, to be the suffering king, is because he knew that we could never save ourselves that we're prone to get it wrong. And tasting his kindness and grace is actually the thing that changes everything. His grace is lavish and ready. So let me sum up as someone nearby starts a lawnmower. Now, Jesus is the Christ and he calls us to acknowledge and confess him as king. And following him means self-denial and suffering and that in that there is life and glory as we lay down our lives and selves for him. Uh, preparing this, I found this passage so confronting because the honest truth is, by nature, I don't enjoy self-denial. I don't like sacrifice or suffering or humiliation. And it's good to know that Jesus isn't calling us to seek out pain in some sort of perverted way. But I have found it to be true that the more that I marvel at the God of the universe, who would love me like this, Jesus would leave the glory and comfort of heaven, deny himself and literally take up his cross to rescue me from my satanic ways. As I see Jesus' supreme value and worth, that the king of the universe loves me, oh, it melts my heart. And I actually find that I begin to want to see his glory and I want to lay my life down. I want to give all I can for his glory because he's been so good to me. I find that forgetting myself actually leads to joy and that only thinking of myself only leads to pain. The more I forget myself, the better life is. And so my prayer for you has been for us, that we would remember how far short we fall, that we would be reminded that we have nothing to offer God, and that we would remember how big Jesus' grace is to those clumsy, foolish disciples, to Peter and to us. 
And so, friends, I want to encourage you to hear the words of Jesus because of his grace and his love, because of his salvation, he rescues us from ourselves and our sin and our foolish ways. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow him. Because laying down your life is the only way to life.